Good morning, everybody. How did everybody sleep? Good? Decent? All right. All right. Nice. All right. Well, last night I introduced myself a little bit. Um, and right now I just wanted to give you a couple, show you a couple pictures of the family again. And they're here and you saw them, but I put a couple up on the slide. We'll get back to that. We'll get there. Before that. There we go. Back to the family of the four of us, yeah. So that's my wife, Melody, who's teaching. And that's Griffin, the three-year-old, and Gavin, the seven-month-old. And next slide. I thought this picture was helpful because I know as musicians, it might be difficult sometimes to balance, balance life. But this guy right here, that's a picture of balance right there, what you see. He's both the musician, the athlete, and the, well, swimming, also sports. And, and happy doing it the whole time. So you can uh, take look at to Griffin as an example of uh, how to stay laid back in the midst of everything in a busy week. Well, a little bit more about myself. I actually grew up near here. I grew up about 20 minutes to half hour away from here in Northeast Philly. Uh, is, is anybody here from the Philly area? All right, quite a bit of you, all right. So I grew up in Northeast Philly. I um, went to a middle school and high school called Cedar Grove Christian Academy. And then I graduated from Calvary Chapel's Christian Academy. And from there, I, uh, couple, any Calvary Chapel? Okay, a few of you, all right, all right. Um, and then I went over to Cedarville in Ohio. I know one of the counselors was Cedarville. All right. Pretty cool. Cedarville. So that's where, that's kind of like my journey of where I went for my early schooling. Um, and my message has a lot to do um, with some of my upbringing. So the, the message for the week, we're calling it the gospel. Know it, live it, share it. And so growing up in a more conservative Christian environment, I went to church down the street from my school. Um, and there was a lot of, not, of it, no fault of my teachers or my parents who loved the Lord and taught the gospel, but knowing it in the intellectual sense was something, is something that really stuck with me, just knowing the gospel, knowing what it was. And to me, that was, that was the gospel, just knowing the facts. Um, but this week, I want to broaden that to talk about knowing it, sharing it, and living it. So for me, it was almost as if the three we're sort of disconnected from each other. Does anyone ever, ever feel that way? Sometimes those three feel disconnected. So while I was right that knowing it, knowing the gospel and knowing my savior was the number one thing, I was right, but I was also wrong at the same time. Yes, we are saved by grace through faith as we come to know the forgiveness of our heavenly father through Jesus. And we certainly don't come to know the Lord by living for him and sharing him. We don't have to do anything to earn it, right? It's Jesus plus nothing equals our forgiveness and salvation. Jesus plus nothing. And so on that way, I was correct. But on the other hand, intellectual knowledge about the gospel never saved anybody from their sins, did it? Even the top-notch Jewish leaders of the day, which we'll probably refer to a couple times, who knew a ton of information about the Old Testament, which was the entire Bible at that time, didn't know Jesus in a forgiveness-receiving slash relational kind of way. They didn't know him as their savior. So the gospel isn't about superior knowledge at all. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know. The who is Jesus Christ, and the most important, he's the most important, who's ever, important person who's ever lived, fully God, fully man, and when that relationship begins, the Holy Spirit begins to live within you, and changes start to happen. You're going to start living for him. You're going to be inclined and motivated to share the gospel with other people, um, and those are going to be a natural consequence of that, not something forced. It's not like something off a checklist when you're at the grocery store. Well, I got my milk now. I have everything I need. No, it's going to naturally come from that relationship with the Lord. So that's going to be where we get started with today, and I'm going to jump into that with our passage. But for now, let's get started with a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning um, excited for a week of uh, camp, and also um, maybe nervous about a few things and the schedule and everything coming up, Lord. But we know that everything that you give us, our gifts, our friendships, the music that we're about to play, everything is a gift from you, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, as we seek to integrate all these things into our life, help us to bring all these things under your rule, Lord. Help us with your Holy Spirit to empower us to do that this very day. In your name, amen. So right now I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 in just a couple minutes. We're going to be looking at that um, verse by verse in a few minutes. So while you're looking that up, I'll give you a little bit of introduction. So at the time when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians, the church was undergoing some confusion as it related to the gospel, particularly the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and what was going to happen in the future for the resurrection of believers from the dead as well. So some of the questions they were asking were, did it really happen when Jesus, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Will it really ever happen for believers? When I die, will I rise again with Christ in that last day? Um, does it really matter? And it was an identity crisis, and this got Paul's attention because he knew that that was the heart of the gospel. If the resurrection never happened, if Jesus really came and lived and really was fully God and fully man and never rose from the dead, it's not really the gospel. So he came to give the people a gospel reminder to bring them back to the thing that was most important. That's that Jesus really did rise from the dead, and that changes everything for us today. So just like the church in Corinth that we're going to be talking about more, we need gospel reminders from time to time to make sure that we stay or are brought back to that foundation of the gospel. It's so important. So I know, life gets complicated, life gets messy, and we get distracted pretty easily. I know it because I do it too. Our priorities easily get out of order. This week you'll have lessons, rehearsals, chapels, meals, time to hang out with friends, then you'll quickly, in a week or two, go back home where you'll have school, family, friends, responsibilities. Life is busy and it's so easy, right, for our priorities to get out of order. So simple to do that. So just like the Corinthian people, we also need gospel reminders to bring us back to the most important thing, and that is Jesus, the simple answer. So the big idea of the passage that we'll be looking over today is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is able to save us, sustain us, and form us into the people that God has called us to be as individuals and as a church body. And I look forward to jumping more into that right now. So if you look at verse 1 and 2, I'll be reading the first two verses. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul starts that out by saying, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. So Paul wants the Corinthians to know what they should already know since they had previously been taught about it. So this isn't the first time they heard it. And I imagine for most of you here this morning, this won't be the first time that you're hearing the gospel. So I'm reminding you of what you already heard and many of you have already received. So this isn't me telling you the gospel for the first time, most likely. This is me reminding you of the gospel, because we all need that. So to get back to the basics, the Corinthian church was founded on the solid belief that God sent his son on a rescue mission to save sinful people by living a perfectly holy life, dying on the cross for our sins, rising again, and promised to return for us in the future. And that right there is foundational, central, and most important to Paul and us, right? As believers, that is so important to us. Paul knew that if a person claiming to be a Christian didn't believe that Jesus came actually as a man and did these things, then they really didn't know the Lord at all. The gospel is the most important thing because there is no salvation apart from Jesus and the resurrection. The church needed to be reminded of the most important thing that makes the church the church. And this morning, we need to be reminded of that as well. So he wanted to remind them of it, and now he said, you received it. So the people, the Corinthian people received it when Paul preached it the first time. And so if you have a relationship with Jesus, this is speaking directly to you. You've already received it, and you've taken a stand on it. Um, they're taking a stand on the reality in the present, and will continue to do that for the remainder of their lives. It says, by this, this gospel, you are saved. So Paul is using some interesting wording here. He uses the present tense, meaning you are saved, but you are being saved, which refers to the present process and a future reality. So it's the already, already not yet principle that theologians have talked about for years. Yes, we have already been justified. We are totally forgiven because of what Jesus did for us. But 
there's another sense in which we're in the process of being saved and being formed into who God wants us to be. And that process is called sanctification, and that happens day by day. God's saving work is both a static event that happened already in our lives, the justification we received, and something that's being worked out in our life over the entirety of our lives till we either see the Lord or he returns. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. And so this is Paul getting very personal with the people again. If the gospel has truly taken root in the believer's life, we're going to continue trusting and abiding in Jesus. And this doesn't mean the Corinthians or we won't have times of doubt and struggle, right? Because we have those things. But there is a sense in which God continues holding us firmly in his grips in the good and the bad times. So you can raise your hand here. Has anyone ever experienced any kind of doubts as a Christian? Ever? Okay. Has anyone ever struggled to live for the Lord? All right. Everybody. The truth here is, is that God doesn't let go of his children and he holds us firmly in his grip. Doubts and struggles does not mean that we don't know the Lord. It means that we do know him and we're living in a sinful body, learning to, learning to live for him and love for him in the midst of that because he holds us firmly in his grip. So we can be confident in that as believers. But then Paul keeps on going to say, otherwise you've believed in vain if you don't hold firmly. Paul's aware that some people may have claimed to believe or trusted in the gospel but maybe they did that rashly and the gospel never actually took root in their lives. This would be the person who believed outwardly with words, but they never internalized the gospel. It was just an outward thing. They would have received the seed in a stony place, such as in the parable of the so uh, sower, if you've ever heard that one. That's Matthew 13, 20 and 21, I'll summarize. As for that was sown on the rocky, stony ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself. He endures for a little while, but when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, immediately he falls away. So someone may have grown up with the tradition in the church, but never actually personally trusted in Jesus. Maybe they were relying on the faith of a mom, a dad, a grandparent, and I don't think Paul meant this to shake true believers. Like I said before, he holds us firmly in our grips within the doubts and struggles that we have. We can live securely knowing that our salvation in Jesus can never be lost. We have been saved by grace, meaning we did nothing to deserve it. There is nothing we can do to lose our salvation. And so I want to be very clear with that as we move on. It seems more likely that Paul wanted, wanted and wants people who mistakenly thought they were believers to know the truth. And he's not being unkind or nasty. This is actually speaking the truth and love to people. He, wanted, he didn't want someone thinking they were a believer um, who didn't really know Christ to continue on with that way. He wanted them to truly know Jesus so the, the word would take root in their lives and they would begin to grow and flourish and produce fruit. Let's move on to verses 3 to 5. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So first, the verse is what I received and I passed on to you. I'm going to be looking up Galatians chapter 1. You can go there with me or I'll just look that up. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 11 to 12. And this is Paul talking about his own journey here. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's Paul. Paul was not talking about one important thing among many. He's talking about the most important thing in his life and any believer's life. It's the gospel. Paul, if you remember, Paul was the guy who persecuted Christians, did everything he could to pull down the early believers of Christ. But then he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he remembers that point vividly of when Jesus called him, not, by the things he was, not because of the things he was doing, but in spite of things he was doing, to the gospel, to the gospel. So the gospel was good news for sinners. Why is that? 
So right here in this passage, we're going to be looking at some of those core elements of the gospel. And even when you know the gospel already, these truths are so important to our lives. So let's look at the picture, the big picture story of the Bible. We'll briefly go through this because we need to keep this fresh in our minds and live in this. Starting in the very beginning, we see in Genesis that God created Adam without sin and with the responsibility to rule and reign over the garden that he gave him. Things at that time were the exact way God intended them to be. Perfect fellowship with his wife Eve and the Lord with no effects of the sin, with sin. Imagine that, not having any effects of sin. Everything about your affections and your mind and heart all working in conjunction with no sin to taint it. And then we know where that goes. Adam disobeyed God. Sin entered the world along with its consequences. Pain, sorrow, death all with that initial decision to disobey God and do his own thing. And with that, he dragged the entire human race along with him. Every single human being, all of us, inherit the sin nature. We sin because we're sinners, and we're sinners because we sin. We choose to sin on a daily basis. We're guilty because of Adam, and we're guilty because of ourselves. And that is not good news right there. That is not good news. That's the bad news. Then when we hear the good news, but God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to this earth to save us from our sin while we were unable to save ourselves. Jesus took upon himself our guilt offering by dying and shedding his blood on the cross. He paid the price once and for all for all of us. In John 19.30, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. In Revelation 5.12, he said, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Only Jesus, being fully God and fully man, could do this, accomplish the gospel and the saving work on our behalf. Then we go on to see that Jesus was buried in this passage. These words highlight that Jesus' sufferings were real. In Matthew 27.66, we see that the authorities made the tomb Jesus was buried secure by sealing the stone and having the guards watch over the scene. This was, not, this was not some light security thing happening. His enemies wanted everyone to know that Jesus was dead. I like this. Theologian Ray Ortland says this about Jesus' burial. In his astonishing love, Jesus identifies with us sinners and suffers fully, omitting nothing. Jesus didn't just go through the process or the motions of dying and burial. He literally went through the whole process, just as, a, just as a human being would. And then the even better news is that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. By rising from the dead, Jesus proved that he was fully God, fully man, overcame death for us so that we could be justified. He paid the sin, price for sin for us. In Romans chapter 4, 23 to 25, but, it, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his, name, his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So Jesus' resurrection is the best news we could ever hear. Best news we could ever hear. So even as we come here together, and most, many of you, I would presume, know the Lord. And to you guys, I would say, the gospel is what we live on day by day. It's the power that fuels us to live for him and share him with other people. We should never get bored of the gospel. We constantly need gospel reminders. I'm going to move on with this. Paul now gives us thoughts as to why the gospel is reliable. In the last couple part of the verses we read, in verse 5, he, Jesus, appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Just like Christ's burial after his death confirms his reality, the stories of his appearances after his death confirms the reality of his resurrection. It wasn't just something that happened in a not real place. People actually saw this. His, the stories of his appearance confirm the reality. It actually happened. It's not figurative. And through the Gospels, we see Jesus appearing to Peter and the other disciples um, before he made himself known to the other believers and groups of people. I'm going to finish off in verse 6 to 8. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them who are still alive, meaning at that time when it was written, though some have fallen asleep. 
Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. That's Paul referring to himself. He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers. So why would Paul need to include the appearance of more than 500 fellow Christians? Why would he have to do that? Why well, jot it down? <clears throat> a couple thoughts on that. So he wanted to highlight, like we said, the truth that Jesus actually rose from the dead. If someone in the area of Corinth, in that city, actually doubted that he rose from the dead, then he could just go to one of those people and talk to them. Say, did you actually see him? And they would be eyewitnesses to what happened. They would back up exactly what was said. And second, it sort of forms a chain from Peter to the 12, to the 500, to James, to the other apostles, and then to Paul himself. It kind of shows a continuity of the gospel happening, being passed on from one to the next. It's kind of like an unbroken chain from one to the next. So he wasn't saying anything new. He wasn't making anything up. It was reliable. And then Paul says this at the end, last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. Sounds like a strange thing to say. So Paul includes himself in the list of those who, were, who, who Jesus appeared to because he was referring to a time in the future when Christ, second here, would appear to others. And he wanted to round off that list. So moving on to verse 9 to 11, he's going to talk a little bit more about his own thoughts on that. Verse 9 to 11, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church, which we talked about a few minutes ago. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. So you might have understood there that Paul talked about himself, regarding himself as least of the apostles. And sometimes people use false humility to say, oh, I wasn't that good. You know, has anyone ever done that before? Maybe you did, you had a great recital or you did great at a sporting event or something at school and someone said, that was awesome what you did. And you're like, oh, that was, that was no big deal. That was easy. Um, and it's kind of like almost a false humility. We've, we've all been there before, but I don't think that's what Paul's doing here. Paul knows the, de- the extent of his depravity here. He knows that he was least of the apostles because he was a persecutor of the apostles. He was actually traveling from town to town trying to drag their ministry down. It wasn't a false humility. He was previously a persecutor of the church acting out of a zeal for the law in the Old Testament. Paul's life was evidence that life transformation really can happen through God's power. Paul had a testimony, and he wanted people to know what happened. Just like we talked about knowing it, living it, and sharing it, which we'll elaborate on other days more, Paul was living it and sharing it because he couldn't hold in, he couldn't hold in all that God did to him and through him through his salvation. Grace takes a person who is unworthy and makes them fit for God's service. God uses people who are unworthy and makes them fit through the gospel. And I believe that God is actively doing that today. Right here in camp with with you guys today, I believe God wants to use you um, through this process of you becoming saved and then as you're through the process of being sanctified and growing in him, living for him, and then sharing him. So Paul's testimony of a radical change brought on by the gospel can empower and challenge us to trust in the work of Jesus alone for salvation. Some of you may not know Jesus. Maybe you were someone who just said the words, and early on in your life you just wanted to say the words because you didn't want to go to hell, and you said a magic formula because that would save you. And so the words never took root in your life. So my challenge out of this message is, through the gospel, to trust in the work of Jesus alone for your salvation. And second, to continue on grounded in the gospel every day of our lives. The church in Corinth and we here as campers, faculty, chapel speaker, we need to be reminded that the gospel should be given first importance in our lives. Why? Back to our big idea, because the gospel of Jesus alone is able to save us, sustain us, and form us into who God has called us to be. So with the last couple minutes, I just want to give you a couple thoughts on applying this. I never like to give too much life application because I believe that as we read God's word, he will be speaking to you individually through his Holy Spirit and applying his word to your life. 
But these are some things that I took from it as I was studying. First, like I mentioned, trust in Jesus. It's not an intellectual exercise, but a real heart, mind, and soul trusting. It's a relationship with Jesus. Um, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. We need to know Jesus is our Savior, and he wants to walk beside us day by day. But before we do that, we need to come to that point of knowing him. Once we're Christians, um, as we're growing and being sanctified and, and living for him, our priorities need to be built around the gospel. When the gospel is made central in our lives, when, when we lose track of the gospel being central and come back to saying, yes, I want my life to be realigned around it, we need to be giving Jesus first place in our lives. When this happens, inside and outside will change. It's going to be an inner transformation that's going to lead towards outward change. And third, this will all happen through the empowering of the Holy Spirit in your life. God doesn't leave us alone to do these things in our life. As Christians, he has left us the Holy Spirit to empower us, strengthen us, convict us, and guide us as we seek to live for him, grow in him, and share him with other people. Um, so I'm going to be leaving with that passage today, is that the gospel is foundational for all of us, whether you've known him for years or you're just getting to know him now. Um, the gospel is foundational to our lives. Let's pray. Lord, as we take our worship and study of your word from this place and into our daily lives, may our lives be sustained through the love of our Heavenly Father, and may we feel the presence of our Savior walking beside us and the power of your Holy Spirit in both our actions and our words as we live our lives. In your name, amen.